What's up, students? Hope you're having the best day of your life today. Today, we are going to talk about the force of friction, pretty much the ways that you can solve for this force of friction. This is going to be good for anybody taking the SAT in the subject matter of physics, if you're taking a basic level high school physics course, or even all the way up to AP Physics 1. Now, we write the force of friction as the symbol F sub F, or just if depending on what you see, just a big, like kind of like a script looking F. And it exists if two conditions are met. So for there to be a friction force, the, an object must interact with a rough surface and a force or component of a force must be acting parallel to the surface. And there's really gonna be two different ways that we are going to find the force of friction. So two ways to find it. The first way is going to be using Newton's second law. And the other way is going to be using the formula for the force of friction. Now, generally, this is going to happen when the object is at a constant speed. And remember, a constant speed can also mean stopped. And this is usually if the object is going to be moving at some speed that is not constant. This is also going to be used when there's not enough givens to solve Newton's second law. Now, I know it might be coming up like in your mind, like there's a rough surface and you might be thinking to yourself, air resistance, is that friction? The drag caused by air resistance is a little bit different. And when we get to the formula side, that's when you really see why I'm going to require this rough surface, because there's a part of this formula that requires the presence of a surface. But first, let me just tell you how to find the force of friction when using Newton's second law. If I have some applied force on a box and that applied force is making this box move at a constant speed. Well, there's some things that we know implied about this constant speed. If speed is constant, that means that the acceleration of the object is zero meters per second squared. And using Newton's second law as F net over M, I can then say that F net on this object is also equal to zero newtons. Now we can find F net by using Newton's second law, A equals F net over M, or I can just find the sum of the forces in a given direction. That also equals F net. So if I know this object is moving at a constant speed, I know that F net is gonna be equal to zero newtons. Therefore, if let's say this had an applied force of six newtons, I know that there must be a force acting this way because if I have F net, equals, let's say to the right, we're going to call positive FA minus this unknown force over here, right? That unknown force would be equal to six newtons because that would be the only thing to make F net equal to zero. And in fact, this is going to be the force of friction, the force that's going to oppose the motion of this block. Now, the same would hold true if this object was stopped. If this object was stopped and I have an applied force here, that would still mean that the force of friction acting on this block is also equal to six newtons. So I can solve for the force of friction when I know the speed is constant by using F net. This is why we love, love, love when an object is at a constant speed because then we don't have to worry about using the formula for friction. But let's say we have to use the formula now. In its most specific sense, the force of friction is gonna be less than or equal to this symbol mu times the force of the normal. I'm gonna explain why this is a less than or an equal sign in just a second. But first, let's talk about the different parts here, this mu and this fn. Mu, right, that's a lowercase, it's not my best mu, I'm sorry, I'm not Greek, but that's a mu, so we call this mu, and it's also equal to the coefficient of friction. Now, what does this mu really mean? Well, if you look it up in a book, it's gonna say it's the ratio of the force of friction to the force of the normal, right? If I divide by Fn on both sides, I would get mu. So we'd also see that it has no unit because it's a ratio, which is great because you don't have to worry about remembering a unit. But what does this actually mean? What mu really is, is how two surfaces interact, right? So if, if we use this word slippery, right? Like ice on ice is really slippery, but I can't put slippery into a formula. So we use mu, and this would be a small mu. But now if we say something is rough, like a block of wood on sandpaper, this would have a larger mu. So mu is just the interaction between an object and its surface and how they rub together. We'll talk more about mu in just one second. The force of the normal, as you may or may not have learned, is a support force. It is the force that pushes perpendicular to a surface, and it usually opposes some sort of gravity or some sort of component of the weight. So something we'll see from this formula, which is a little bit counterintuitive, is that surface area does not affect friction. 
And the reason why is, frankly, surface area is not in the friction formula. And like I said, a little bit counterintuitive, right? Because we think we need really big tires for a lot of friction, but that's really not the case. We want our tires nice and thick for other reasons that have nothing to do with friction. So if you had a block of wood, and maybe it was like a rectangular cube, if you were to lay that block on the ground with the big area face down and you were to find the force of friction and then turned it up on its side, you would see that the frictional force would be identical. And this is something that will most likely be tested, or at least they will make sure that you understand this point, that surface area does not affect the force of friction. So now let's talk more about this mu and also why is this a less than or equal to sign? Well, we know from Newton's third law that an action force is going to have an equal and opposite reaction force depending on its potential for force or how much force it can exert. And what we're going to see is that there's two different types of mu. We are going to have something called a static mu, and that's just going to be shown as mu static. And I'm going to have a kinetic mu, and that is going to be given by mu kinetic. We use static mu up until the object begins to move. So when you see a question that says how much force is required to get an object to start moving, this is going to be the mu that we are going to use, where this is present if the object is already moving. And in every single case, mu static is going to be greater than mu kinetic. It is harder to get an object moving, get an object rolling. It is harder to get something moving than it is to keep it rolling. And you might have experienced that in a few spots in your life. Maybe you had a, you know, uh, your car broke down and you wanted to move it to the side of the road. Well, you start rocking that car back and forth and back and forth. And then once you get it going, it's easy to keep going. Or if you've ever like pushed a sled or something like that, it's always easier to keep an object moving than to get it moving. And the reason for that is because mu static is going to be always greater than mu kinetic. So we can say that the maximum static friction is just gonna be the force of friction times mu static times the force of the normal. So this is the maximum amount of static friction force that I can create. Where down here, the force of friction for a mu kinetic is given by this formula. So why did I have this less than or equal to sign? Well, let's say I did some math, and I'm going to bring this down over here for a second. Let's say I did some math, and I found out the maximum static friction force was, say, uh, 6 newtons. Well, if I had a box on here, right, and I was applying a force, and this box was not moving, and I had applied force of 1 newton, well, static friction force would be 1 newton. That would be due to Newton's third law. If I was to increase this now and say this is 5 Newtons, well, then the friction force would act as 5 Newtons. So it will be anything less than or equal to, right? If I got this up here and this was 6 and the force of friction would be 6, I would have to go above and beyond. My applied force would have to be greater than 6 Newtons for that object to move. And that's really why we say this is like a general sense. Once we get specific and we start talking about the maximum static friction or the force required to get this thing moving or the force that we need to overcome to get it moving and then the static friction over here, the force that is moving. So as a recap, I find the maximum static force, so the force to overcome friction as this formula here and then I find the static of, of kinetic friction by either saying mu kinetic times the force of the normal or it's equal to the applied force at a constant speed. And if you're new to the force of the normal, guys, there is no formula for the force of the normal. You must solve it. But on a flat horizontal surface where it's not moving up or down, we would generally say that Fn is going to be equal to mg. So if I had some friction force here and I knew the coefficient of friction between these two objects, I would just say that the force of friction is going to be equal to mu mg. And that's because Fg is mg. And because of Newton's second law, these two things would be set equal to another. So this might be another expression for you to see when it's on a flat horizontal surface. When it's on an incline, guys, remember that the force of the normal is still perpendicular to the surface. And if you haven't learned incline planes, I have a couple incline plane videos. Um, if you're in my course, we'll get to that. But the Fn here is not equal to mg. Right here, this is going to be equal to some component of mg, which is going to be cosine of theta if this is theta. But if you need some more review on that, that's how we find Fn. I just wanted to show you that 
Fn is not always equal to Mg. It really depends on what's going on because in this case, weight points straight down and Fn still points perpendicular to the surface. And if this box was sliding down, then we would just point the force of friction up this way. If the box was being pulled up by some applied force, then we'd have the force of friction pointing this way with the force of gravity that acts parallel to the surface as well. And friction would actually work in conjunction with that parallel force, which is going to be equal to mg sine makes it slide. And like I said, this is a little bit, if you're not up to inclined planes yet, don't be too intimidated by what I just drew. I'm just showing you that force of friction is going to be used all over the course. Hope this introduction to friction helped you out, guys. If it did, please leave the video a thumbs up so somebody else will get it and the YouTube algorithm will push it out to all the physics students all over the world. And until I see you guys in the next one, stay positive, keep working really, really hard, and always just please be nice to other people. I'll catch you on the next one, guys.